Well, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. This is Joy Burkhardt, and I'm the Executive Director of 2020 Mom. We're so thrilled that um, so many of you are with us today. So far, we have about 65 people uh, with us live on the webinar, and we know many more will be watching the recording. We will be recording today's session and sending out both the slides and the recording to all of you who have registered today. Before we get started, I wanted to quickly ask who's on the line, and we're going to do this by asking you to use the raise your hand feature on your GoToWebinar control panel. So if you could, uh, hopefully you can all see that raise your hand feature. Um, and if you can't, let us know through the question feature on the GoToWebinar panel if you can't see that, but it should be alongside your GoToWebinar um, control panel at the very bottom. There's a little red hand uh, at the very bottom on the left side of your GoToWebinar control panel. If you can't see that control panel, it's probably behind another um, screen, so you can toggle um, on your screen and let us know. It looks like you guys can see that hand. So we're going to ask um, all of you to let us know who's on the line today. Um, we're first going to ask if you are a healthcare professional, so a clinical professional, if you could raise your hand using that raise your hand feature. Okay, great. We see Kara and Brooke and Terry, Tamika, Thomas, uh, Nicole, Deborah. Great. Um, quite a few clinicians, I would say, on the line. All right, we're going to put your hands down and we're going to ask now um, how many of you are um, in government? So, are you a government professional, uh, work in public health or maternal child health, perhaps? Um, in a WIC program, uh, even uh, from a state legislator's office. I've seen quite a few hands go up. Um, looks like there's about, goodness, maybe 20 of you on the line. Well, welcome. We're glad you're with us. You play a critical role in maternal mental health. Um, we're going to ask now how many of you are, how many of you would consider yourselves survivors or advocates? because of a loss or a friend. Great, so hi, Adrian and Brooke and Sarah and Jill. I recognize many of your names. Hi, Cindy Newton, quite a few of you, and Alyssa. And I know many of you wear multiple hats. And now I'm going to put your hands down, and I'm going to ask, um, for those of you who didn't fall into one of those three categories, would you please let us know using the question feature of the GoToWebinar control panel um, what role you play and why you're here today? And we'll just take a quick look at those comments to make sure we're, we're not forgetting anyone. We, we have some do, a doula on the phone. Um, and some are clinical professionals, and you know, most are not, more like peer supporters. Great. Glad you're with us, Melissa. Um, a director of a first five program, a home visiting program. Excellent. Peer supporters. A program analyst in a health program. Excellent. Early childhood consultant. More peer support. Uh, Nick, you are in. Okay, great. Well, good. That gives us um, more home visiting uh, and executive director of a, no a nonprofit. Excellent. Um, a maternal child health uh, educator. So we've got quite a great audience here today. We're glad you're with us. We um, want to first start by sharing just a little bit about who we are and uh, who 2020 Mom is. And then I'll go over our agenda for today. We're going to make sure that there's time for questions and answers. Um, and then we'll um, make sure that we give you uh, some tools to walk away with as well. So I'm going to start by, I realized I didn't include a photo of me in today's deck, so I'm just going to introduce myself from a website of photo. There I am, probably a few pounds heavier and now have brown hair, um, but there's a picture of me. Again, I'm the executive director of 2020 Mom. A little bit more about 2020 Mom. We were formed in 2011. Next month, we'll be uh, eight years old. 
and we were formed at the suggestion of the California legislature in 2010. We first started as a coalition here in California, but soon realized after about a year of work that the work that we were doing was not unique to California and was really a, a system framework on how to increase the diagnosis and treatment rates of maternal mental health. We launched then um, as 2020 Mom or 2020 Mom Project and our official 501c3. We also um, wanted to share that we had an opportunity, as many of you um, recall, to host the National Coalition for Maternal Mental Health, which many um, folks remember the work of that um, coalition. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the legislation that was passed through that coalition here in a, in a bit. Uh, our mission is to close gaps in maternal mental health care. Um, so a bit of a broad mission there, but our niche and strength really is in knowledge of the complex healthcare system. And we believe that if families, employers, and society are paying for healthcare benefits, that the healthcare delivery system ought to diagnose and treat maternal mental health disorders, which we all, many of us know, um, is not happening routinely right now. So let's move on to um, the agenda. Um, we're going to cover today an overview of national agencies' um, positions on maternal depression and maternal mental health disorders. We're going to also talk a little bit about the federal legislation um, that was passed several years ago and what's unfolded since. We're going to talk a little bit about the state um, legislation trends and what we're seeing on that front. And then also, um, there have been requests that we, again, go over the California Strategic Plan. There have been several states that have issued white papers or frameworks for change. Um, California was one of the recent uh, states, so we'll just spend a little bit of time on what kind of the core learnings and core um, suggestions and pathways for change are in that report as an example. Um, and then we'll have time for wrap-up and resources and q and A. I I want to just remind you before we jump into the content, if you have questions at any point um, uh, about uh, what you're hearing, you're welcome to use the question feature in the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll take some strategic breaks and then uh, make sure that we're answering those questions um, at the right time. Excellent. So let's start with the national agency. Um, uh, national bodies uh, recommendations around maternal mental health. So um, at first, though it's not on the screen, want to acknowledge the American Academy of Pediatrics who really um, for, has been a leader in, on this front in maternal mental health, recognizing that untreated depression and anxiety in um, pregnancy or the postpartum period uh, leads to childhood developmental delays. And they were the first agency to declare that um, maternal depression was the uh, most uh, undiagnosed obstetric complication in America, and others have since repeated that statement. Um, again, they're not on the slide here. Um, they have been recommending screening in their Bright Futures programs um, uh, since the 1990s um, for, for quite a long time. Again, really a leader um, in, in this front and declaring the importance of uh, screening for uh, postpartum depression and maternal mental health disorders. Today, though, I wanted to focus on some of the recent trends um, that many of us have been hearing about and that really have begun to create this upswell of movement in our space. And I'm going to start with the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Uh, so we're so thrilled, like all of you, if you were following the news back in um, May 2017, um, to hear that the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology was essentially overturning its prior position, which said, uh, its prior position said that there wasn't enough research to recommend screening for maternal depression. Um, uh, in 2017, they overturned that position and recommend, recommended that OBGYN screen at least once during pregnancy and the postpartum period for depression and, and anxiety. And when I mean, when I say at least once, I should really be saying at least once during the perinatal period. So it's not once during pregnancy and once in the postpartum period, it's at least once. And we'll talk a little bit when we get to the California um, strategic plan, you know, what some folks are recommending. If you're only going to screen once, what, when should you do it? We'll talk about that in a bit. In 2018, um, uh, they also, and actually that should say 2019, 
it was 2019 last year in April that ACOG um, redesigned and introduced a new process uh, and focus on postpartum care. Uh, as many of you know and have heard often, right, unless you have a C-section, you'll get one postpartum visit um, that's covered typically at six weeks. If you've had a C-section, it would be two postpartum visits at two weeks and perhaps um, six weeks. And the focus on redesigning postpartum care, um, again, we applaud ACOG for um, recognizing that importance. And in part, um, you know, we, we understand that that, um, that new position um, was put in place to also address the importance of monitoring for um, postpartum mental health challenges. So again, that was in 2017 and 2018. Uh, or 19. I'm going to double check that date. If someone knows it, wants to plop it in um, in the Q&A dialogue, that would be great. I just saw that screen and now can't recall uh, what date it was um, exactly. So we'll get that updated before we send out the slide. I also want to share, you know, what's really um, uh, as monumental and important in our movement is that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, um, which is the body that um, under the o o Obamacare Act or the ACA requires that any preventive services recommended by this body, and, and this body is basically combing through volumes of research on various um, uh, illnesses and disease states and making recommendations on what um, services should be covered, or I'm sorry, what, where there's enough evidence to screen for particular disease states and even treat in order to prevent certain disease states, and when they make a recommendation to um, do one of those things, health insurers now under the ACA have an obligation to cover those, um, those screenings and that treatment. It doesn't necessarily mean that providers will deliver the treatment, uh, but there's an obligation to pay if a provider bills for such treatment. So this was also very exciting news that once um, ACOG overturns it, its position, the U.S. Preventive Services a Task Force also took um, another look at their um, their uh, general depression guideline, which was issued in 2009 to screen the general um, adult population for depression, and they overturned their prior um, position to exclude. Uh, the perinatal population from their recommendation um, because there was no, not enough evidence, the same thing that ACOG grappled with previously and in 2017 <clears throat> also recommended screening for um, maternal depression. Uh, also earlier this year, I think some of you may have followed that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force took another step, which we really haven't seen um, happen in, in other disease states. So it's very exciting that it happened with maternal mental health, um, that they actually reviewed um, the, the research around how to pre prevent maternal depression. So they um, found that there was evidence to suggest that cognitive behavioral therapy is successful in preventing those that are at high risk. Of, uh, of a maternal mental health disorder from getting a maternal mental health disorder and so now recommend screening and treatment for the prevention of maternal depression. I'm going to just pop over to um, one of the blog posts. I want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to go back into our um, blog and get more details on any of these positions that I've talked about. Here's the post, for example, on the new recommendation to screen for the prevention of maternal depression. We include um, in this post um, a screening tool, essentially, which pulls together from the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force uh, the questions that um, determine who might be at risk for maternal depression. Um, and of course, those um, who would answer yes to any of those questions would then be referred for CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, or interpersonal therapy, which was also um, acknowledged in their uh, most recent um, statement on maternal depression. So feel free to take a look at that later. I want to share, um, you know, that there's often a misnomer and we get very excited, as we should, um, for such positions to be released. Um, but just, just uh, in, in the last couple of weeks, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality um, published a study and results to look at how often providers are screening for 
um, depression in the general adult population. And again, I want to remind you that the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, this agency has recommended um, that primary care providers screen for depression in the adult population. They made that recommendation in 2009. So um, in 2015, the latest study year, um, AHRQ found that only 35% of adults were screened for depression. So again, very exciting and an important first step, but there's still much work to do um, to ensure that screening is happening and treatment is provided. I will quickly touch on, I don't add this to the slide, but some of you may be wondering, like, how do we actually monitor how often OBGYNs, for example, are screening for depression? And I want to share that there's a new measure that's been developed. It's called the HEDIS measure. Some of you may um, know about other HEDIS measures for certain diabetes uh, or certain states uh, or uh, diagnoses like diabetes, um, heart disease, et cetera. Uh, so there is a new HEDIS measure that's been developed, um, which we're quite excited about um, uh, to, to uh, have health insurers. Those measures are rolled out through health insurers who um, report on how often the uh, OBGYNs, for example, in this measure are screening for maternal depression at least once to match the ACOG recommendation, and then they report their findings to a national body. So we will soon have a metric um, that will uh, allow us um, all to measure how often screening is happening, and we'll be able to do that on a state and regional basis. So let's move into um, federal legislation. Again, really an exciting um, time. Um, there was a piece of federal legislation, for those of you who know the state of Massachusetts, has been one of the leaders in addressing maternal mental health, um, and they were one of the first states that or the first state and only state that created a um, legislative caucus for maternal mental health uh, to look at legislative policy around uh, maternal mental health. And there's a picture down there at the bottom of the screen of Catherine Clark, um, and co congressional woman Catherine Clark, who saw the great work that was happening, particularly around the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Program for Moms, so the McPat for Moms program and knew that that model should attempt to be replicated in other states. She introduced the federal legislation bringing postpartum depression out of the Shadows Act, um, also called the MMH Act in our world. It asked that a federal agency, now HRSA, um, the federal agency HRSA, um, to provide grants to at least five states for innovative solutions to improve access to maternal mental health care such as psychiatric consult lines, which is the program that McPap for moms provides to OBGYNs, et cetera. Um, the Act bill passed in, uh, in November 2007 and was signed by Obama into the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, many of you um, um, know that the um, lobbyist in our space that was working on this, um, who is such beloved in our, our space, Jamie Belsito, was critical to helping to get that legislation passed on behalf of the National Coalition for Maternal Mental Health. There are some great partners involved in um, also lobbying to ensure that that bill passed. Uh, we have also shared on our blog with the states that were issued grants last year as a part of that program. Uh, I will pull that up quickly here and show you how we can do a search on the website um, to find that uh, that blog post in case any of you are interested. They actually ended up giving out grants to seven states. And it um, is really the states that received those grants. Some of you have asked, um, some of you have asked uh, were states that, that had current infrastructure in place, and many of them had current infrastructure around telehealth in place. And it actually wasn't just um, it actually ju wasn't just states that were addressing mental health. Um, some of the states that received these grants were doing like rural um, uh, telephone um, access service work, where there wasn't um, sort of Wi-Fi or telephone technology in certain certain rural communities. And those states um, received some grants too. So kind of interesting to look at the trends there. And PERSA has shared that they're interested in sharing um, with the maternal mental health community 
um, the findings from those states, like what's happening. So we look forward to partnering with them and bringing you more information around outcomes from those states. You can see them on the map here. And move on to um, sort of our latest and the latest advocacy efforts in maternal mental health. Um, in 2018, uh, 2016 actually was the first Hill Day um, to make sure, in DC, to make sure that that legislation passed and Congress heard from mothers about the importance of passing the Bringing Postpartum Depression Out of the Shadows Act. Um, there was a, another Hill Day in 2016 also in 2018, um, an expanded partnership to do a Hill Day with another organization called March for Moms. And then in 2019, this year in May, another Hill Day um, uh, happened um, and it was launched as a Mom Congress Hill Day and brings together um, many other nonprofits in the space um, to bring the voices of mom, moms to the Hill. Um, I'm sharing this because it's, it's exciting for our cause to be part of the larger maternity care movement, improvement movement. As many of you know, um, the U.S. has the highest maternal mortality rate and the only um, of any developed country and the only rising maternal mortality rate in the world, um, which has shocked many um, people. And uh, mater maternal suicide is a leading cause of maternal um, death. And so it's an exciting time for all of us to be working on this together. The bills that were um, championed uh, this year were put forth through what we called the Momnibus. Um, we were happy to work directly with the um, Maternity Care Caucus on the Hill, the legislators that are part of that um, caucus to develop the Momnibus. Um, and one of their leaders was so excited uh, about sharing the use of that term um, with us so that that um, term could be used to include all um, concerns and, and bills that moms um, focused on early, early parenting, pregnancy and early parent, and parenting want to promote. Um, the momnibus included um, reference to um, a new maternal mental health initiative, uh, a federal initiative and we actually didn't need to introduce the bill this year, which was quite exciting, um, but instead um, timed it um, a right enough to go through the appropriations committee um, with or appropriations process on a national level, uh, which essentially um, uh, works to ensure that there's funding to do something. And sometimes you don't ne then need to follow, um, uh, follow up with a piece of legislation if there's funding um, to call for something. And so we were interested in having a coordinating committee of federal agencies um, to come together and talk about their work in addressing maternal mental health. Um, it's very much like our kind of fragmented healthcare system um, where maternal mental health does not fit cleanly into any one agency's box, just like it doesn't fit cleanly into any one healthcare provider's box, right? Um, psychiatrists are often involved, pediatricians, OBGYNs, um, other, other um, birth workers, uh, midwives, et cetera. And so there's a, there's a need to coordinate uh, and make sure that um, a mother isn't falling through the cracks and there's a need um, for maternal mental health to no longer fall through the cracks. Uh, and so we hope that this coordinating committee effort will be funded. Um, we, uh, we, we don't have the latest news um, yet and we're still waiting since Congress is not um, currently in session to kind of see where all of this lands, but we're, we're hopeful that that coordinating committee will get funded. And I should also say there's the website from Mom Congress if anyone's interested in learning more. Um, those that attend uh, the event in May are um, mothers and the, the focus is on mothers and the voice of the mother, um, but we know many of you on the line are mothers. So let's move into the states that have addressed maternal mental health. You can see here on my slide um, uh, that there are um, several that have addressed maternal mental health in various ways. I'd love for any of you who are on the line um, to share any corrections or additions if you feel like we've missed something um, uh, with us through email or even in using the question feature on the GoToWebinar control panel. So you can see um, first the, green, the blue box at the top um, were states that passed legislation in 2018, so last year. You can take a quick look at that box. We'll go into detail on some of these here in just a moment. Um, the light blue box are states that ran commissions recently. 
um, commissions or task forces. We'll also go into detail on what those look like here in just a moment and why we believe that that's critically important. Uh, the purple box here are states that address maternal mental health awareness in the past and or screening. And there's just a couple of states that have addressed screening or a handful of states, I should say, that have addressed screening and all of those other states are um, states that have addressed awareness through awareness resolutions declaring the month of May, Maternal Mental Health and Awareness Month, for example. Um, Illinois and Texas are the two states that have addressed um, what we call infanticide, um, which is when a mother has taken the life of her baby. Um, in, in, in our case, you know, in the state of um, a psychosis is what we're talking about. Um, and Illinois most recently passed an infanticide law, and we won't go into detail about that. Texas has attempted, it was a bit ahead of its time, I think, and um, I think many states are going to start to be interested, especially those who've already done baseline work in maternal mental health, which is critical first. Um, um, those states that have done that baseline work in maternal mental health may start to look at um, Illinois' law as well. And then New York City is its own jurisdiction. It works like a state, um, and they have been continuously doing great work to address maternal mental health. I'm actually going to talk a little bit about something that just came through from New York City um, this year uh, here in a moment. And then the green line here are um, also states that declared the month of May Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month, so a bit of an overlap with that purple bar. Um, and then there's an asterisk there for states that um, have begun to reimburse pediatricians for um, for children for screening um, of mothers um, through the Medicaid or CHIP program. And actually, there's a lot more states now um, that have issued such positions. So that asterisk is actually a bit out of uh, out of date. If anyone's interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to send you more information. All right, so let's talk a little bit about those states that passed legislation in 2018. Um, we're gonna start with Utah and Michigan. Um, so they just duplicated prior state awareness resolutions declaring the month of May, Maternal Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, Maryland um, also passed um, a, a law that required the Department of Health to develop continuing education for, pro for providers in maternal mental health, expand the state's pediatric consultation line, similar to the Massachusetts Child Psychiatry Access Line um, to include uh, providing consultation to OBs on maternal mental health disorders, um, also to create materials and list information on their website. Um, if anyone is from Maryland, we'd love to hear from you. Um, last we have heard, even though that bill passed, um, there was never any funding in, um, put in place to actually launch those programs um, because of a change in governor who was really interested in um, kind of slashing the budget in some in some cases. Um, so if anyone has an update on that front, would love to hear. Um, last year, uh, the FAMLA, Florida, excuse me, Families First Act was passed. Um, many of you know Lauren De Apala, um, who we've had the great pleasure to, to work with and support in her work, um, was really uh, led the effort in her state, um, a mom and a, a therapist, um, to run a coalition that passed that legislation. And like many states, what she set out to introduce um, uh, was much different. And what they introduced was much different than what got passed, but it's still a great step in the right direction. You can see here um, that it requires the Department of Public Health to provide awareness materials um, on its website and uh, information through the family line. It's already um, an existing toll-free line for families to call for various help. Um, and also through providers and requires birth hospitals to screen for maternal depression. California, there were two bills that were passed last year. Um, one is AB 3032, Hospital Maternal Mental Health. Um, that bill requires hospitals to train staff, um, clinical staff that interact with perinatal women, and also to educate patients prior to discharge about the range, range of disorders and signs and symptoms. And um, the most exciting part of that bill is also requires hospitals to provide information about local treatment options, if any. Um, so we actually are really excited about that component uh, because we know that many hospitals will find there aren't treatment resources that are easy to find and that women will start to speak up when they are suffering and hospitals will want to have a place 
to refer them. So we're hopeful that hospitals will start to um, create programs themselves or um, fund through their um, foundations, local program development, et cetera. That bill becomes effective 1-1-2020, so isn't effective yet. Uh, AB 2193 requires OBGYNs effective last month. Um, I'm sorry, obstetricians, uh, so including midwives, um, family practice providers who are still delivering babies and OBGYNs to screen um, at least once during the perinatal period. Also requires insurers to develop programs to support um, providers and patients in accessing services. I'm going to go through one more slide, and then we're going to pause for questions. So these are the states that addressed policy in 2019. Um, Utah was able to do something very similar to what we're trying to do at a national level. They didn't have to introduce legislation, which is exciting, but instead increased funding through their um, budget for an existing line item in their state budget for early childhood um, development and, and increased funding to address maternal mental health through that budget line. In Virginia, and I know, Adrian, you're on the line, you spearheaded much of this work, um, so feel free to add anything here. We're happy to read from the comments section or the question feature on GoToWebinar. Um, but Virginia um, uh, passed legislation that adds education about maternal anxiety to the list of topics, hospitals, midwives, etc need to address with patients, so not to leave out anxiety, which many of us know is often a precursor and um, co-occurring with depression. California has one more bill that's going to the legislature uh, uh, that is expected to pass and get signed, and it encourages the state medical board, so the body that licenses MDs, to create a training program for those providers um, it would be uh, optional to those providers, but still available. Again, a step in the right uh, direction, if not a perfect piece of legislation. Um, also, um, just wanted to share that uh, there was another bill that ran in California's legislature this year that basically created that McPat for Moms model. Um, and um, for due to a technical reason, um, it, it uh, died in session this year. That's what we call when a bill doesn't um, continue to move through the process and will get reintroduced next year, and that bill was 2193. Um, and then there have been continued um, legislative attempts in Pennsylvania, again, another state that has um, really been putting effort around maternal mental health, um, um, uh, although I would say not kind of in an organized way. There have been three, three different efforts, as I recall, um, different legislators trying to do different things, um, uh, but you know, not a, a strong coalition there to help um, move the needle uh, yet. So I'm going to stop. Um, actually, I want to let me just go over the New York legislation first, and then we're going to pause for questions and any comments that folks want to share. So I did want to share that um, in 2005, New York um, passed legislation that's now effective and more guidance has been shared um, uh, in 2019 and, and asks that health insurers and health insurance policies provide coverage for screening, referral, and treatment. Um, provided by, uh, the AD shouldn't be there, obstetricians, gyne gynecologists, or pediatricians, um, really consistent with the Obamacare and U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, um, right, that, that those um, services should be billed at no charge or no cost share to the patient because it's considered preventive. Um, interestingly, treatment in the past has not been considered preventive, um, so there's some interesting movement here. Um, and then I also added here, if um, billed by the pediatrician, they added this additional guidance. And I think this is interesting, and other states are grappling with this as well. So if a pediatrician screens um, under a separate policy, so that would be the child health care policy, since often children are covered under, um, when we're not in an employer-based situation, employer coverage situation, but a public coverage situation um, covered under their own Medicaid or CHIP policy, um, it says the pediatrician um, can um, uh, or insurer can coordinate benefits and that it's not the intent that services um, be covered under both OBs and pediatricians. Uh, and I, I raise this because I think it is um, quite a conundrum and also um, 
points to what a trend that we're starting to see that if there were to be one home base for screening and detection um, that would be you know, reimbursable, that, um, that folks are really starting to look at, at the OBGYN playing that role. Um, and again, pediatricians have been um, at the forefront of this movement, um, but, but now recognizing you know, for a number of reasons, um, one being that more women than ever have pre-existing depression or anxiety before they get pregnant that may not have been treated appropriately, um, or uh, the fact that new onset of depression and anxiety happens almost as frequently in pregnancy as in the postpartum period, and also the fact that untreated depression and anxiety during depression is a leading cause of preterm birth it points to the fact, well, one more thing, um, uh, it's always been a struggle that um, pediatricians are not the mother's treating provider, there's also just added privacy issues, right? Um, but OBGYNs are the mother's treating um, provider and really for all those reasons have a, a opportunity to detect and treat and develop treatment plans in coordination with other mental health providers um, to get mom into treatment um, right away and perhaps starting in pregnancy, which is again, what's, what's being recommended. So I wanted to point that out and I think we're gonna start to see that challenge we've heard about in Colorado for quite some time too, if you're only going to get only one screening and gets reimbursed, who should do it? Um, and again, I think this is what New York is, has been grappling with and had to issue this bulletin on this year. So let me pause for questions. And Crystal on our team is uh, on the line as well. Um, Crystal, do we have any questions that have come in that you'd like to read? Uh, not at this time. I'm just reviewing everything. We had a note. Um, okay, here's a question for you. For those of us from states that have not taken steps in the direction of maternal mental health and do not have the experience in working with politicians or in the political arena, can you provide recommendations to start the process of getting some of these policies started in our states? Yes, and I'm gonna hold that question for the end of the presentation, because um, it's the perfect opportunity to lead into our wrap up. Um, so thank you for that, and I suspect there's quite a few of you on the line that have that same question. Crystal, is there anything else? That that... Is, that's it for questions at the moment. Okay, great. Well, let's keep going. Um, so I wanted to share that, um, you know, the how. So how have many of the states that have addressed, and again, I'm starting to answer that question, um, how, um, how does one go about running legislation in their state? You know, are there other levers um, in the deck that I just modified? We had another slide about other levers, so you don't have to always think about um, legislation. Um, and in fact, I'm just going to go through those now and I'll add them back into this deck, even though you hadn't seen them on the screen. And we'll add them back into the deck uh, so that you have it in, in, the, in the version that goes out with the recording um, in a couple of days. So let me just go over a couple levers besides introducing legislation, um, which is really not for the faint of heart. If anyone's been involved, it is, it is grueling work and you have to be um, on call. Um, you have to be ahead of the game in addressing and anticipating questions and meeting proactively um, with various uh, committee members, health policy committee uh, members, um, the appropriations committee, um, uh, et cetera. So a lot of work. And so we do really like to spend some time on what are the other levers. And first I would say um, many of your state agencies already have interest in this topic, but don't know who to involve in various um, programs and activities. Uh, your Department of Public Health, some states use different names. Um, Department of Hygiene is, a, is one name. Your Department of Public Health may go by um, you know, various iterations, but many states use the name Department of Public Health. Um, a key partner, some, uh, a, a not, uh, an agency that you may want to set up time with and not to be shy. Um, you know, they want to hear from you. Uh, and we're happy to kind of coach you if you uh, want to, to draft an email to kind of request some time, et cetera. We're happy to help you with that. Um, your Medicaid agency in your state, uh, for, for various reasons, um, be, because your Medicaid agency, again, those are the public, the public um, insurance policies. 
your Medicaid agencies are taking a lot of note um, because of of um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force recommendations that that um, providers screen for maternal depression. Medicaid agencies have to issue guidance to the Medicaid insurers on what will be covered, how it should be billed. Then they provide that information to um, to their network of providers. So state Medicaid agencies are key partners. Um, I will share a recent blog post in California that just went up on our site um, that talks a little bit about what's happening in California. So you can see here, California's Medicaid program now reimburses screening and treatment to prevent maternal depression. So again, in line with the US Preventive Services Task Force um, most recent position on screening and preventing um, treatment. So you can find more information here. Um, I think California, from what we've seen, is the first state to issue something like this. It doesn't mean uh, I think other agencies are um, looking to do the same and probably have something in the works. So just knowing that you're out there as a clinician or even a patient advocate, um, I think they will find that quite helpful. There's also um, perinatal um, quality committees um, in various States that are looking to improve maternity care um, in various ways. You should Google them in your state, perinatal quality um, collaboratives or committees, um, PRCs. And there's also many states have now developed a maternal mortality review committees and are looking for patient advocates or clinicians to sit on those committees. Again, we're happy to help, um, help you if you're interested in making connections there, but do Google um, um, maternal mortality review committees or PRCs in your states to see if there's opportunities and we're happy to uh, help when you've done a little research. Um, so I wanted to start there. Um, of course, you can always schedule appointments with your legislators in your state or even your federal Congress members who are back home because Congress is in recess um, to talk about your interests and why this matters to you. It's really important that we begin to educate even if we're not ready to introduce new legislation you know, at a state level, et cetera, um, you may find your champion or they may say, I think you should talk to the state's maternity caucus. Um, and that's a group of legislators and their staff members who are interested in improving maternity care and want to um, uh, address legislation. So those are the levers I would say, again, we'll add that slide back in. Um, and that's where we encourage any of you to start, um, not to just try to introduce legislation um, from, you know, out of the gate. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about um, really, in addition to having those levers that any of us as individuals can, can um, start to use, states that are serious about addressing maternal mental health um, in, in a big way, we are strongly encouraging um, development of state task forces or um, blue ribbon commissions. They're essentially one in the same, different states would use different terminology, um, Blue Ribbon Commissions are generally funded by um, state public dollars to study an issue and report back to the legislature. Um, task forces um, can be ongoing or temporary, depending on how your state looks at it, and sometimes they're privately funded. Uh, so there's various ways to go about it, but essentially we're talking about a multi-stakeholder organization um, or group, rather, that comes together to study maternal mental health and issue a strategic plan to the state. Um, the way that we recommend going about doing this is working with your state legislature to encourage um, the formation of a, a commission or task force. Um, and Michigan is doing this right now. Uh, we've been coaching them along and shared how this works in California. We shared the resolution that called for the formation of a task force that was privately funded in California. That was the right thing to do at the time because of budget restrictions in California um, and was really um, quite helpful in bringing in two new funders to the space because they saw that that uh, state legislature encouraged the formation, sort of instant credibility, right? Um, and brought that to the funders and they wanted to be a part of it. One of the funders is now one of the biggest national funders in maternal mental health. Um, and I think it's safe to say would not have been engaged or at least not as early on this issue had we not brought the opportunity to them. So again, this is what we're saying if you're serious about, about this work um, should happen in your state that a multi-stakeholder group 
um, appointed members. And we can get into those details offline if anyone is interested. Um, various trade associations, ACOG, others need to be represented. Um, insurers, uh, health, uh, uh, hospital trade associations, um, the nurse, the nurses that treat um, um, women um, in hospital settings. Um, all of those trade associations should be represented, and um, uh, the recommendations um, majority, you know, majority vote. Um, and so that's what happened in California. So the emphasis is really sort of, again, multi-stakeholders. Um, and what, what we love about this work is that it plants seeds in these groups that may not have been thinking about maternal mental health. I think now, as we've talked about, everyone's sort of thinking about it now because you can't you not think about it with all the trade associations addressing maternal mental health in the last couple of years, um, but maybe struggling to figure out what to do, right? So. Um, um, it's not even as much about buy-in anymore as it was several years ago, but about multi-stakeholders coming together, understanding the challenges, and kind of pushing each other to come up with a state strategic plan that folks can live with, even if they don't all agree with all of the recommendations. So Massachusetts um, has, uh, I'm talking about a couple states here, Massachusetts I already hit on, um, was the first state to have a legislative, a standing legislative commission, and also a public health department that's really leading the way and has been given funds through state budget um, to do work around maternal mental health. Um, I also wanted to point out the other states that have run task forces. Um, the Utah um, Maternal Mental Health Collaborative, Florida, we've already talked about the legislation that they passed, but they issued a state strategic plan. Um, and that's available on the Florida Maternal Mental Health Collaborative website. Um, Maryland, we talk about the legislation that they introduced earlier that didn't get funded. That legislation though came from the, the task force uh, that was run really at the same time as California. Their report came out earlier, um, uh, but a lot of similar recommendations. So I wanted to just touch on, we've got about 10 minutes left. I'm gonna take five minutes to go through some of the key points in the California task force or strategic plan because I think you'll be interested. Many of these, these um, points are sort of similar from other states. I think California is, is probably or is the most um, comprehensive, uh, which is why it's a nice one to present. It touches on um, various um, topics. So this is the task force, the picture of all the various members that um, came together. Um, some of the moms who are on the task force aren't in this photo. Um, but those were the, um, the task force members. And interestingly, the task force felt very strongly um, about setting a goal. So how do we know if, you know, what we're recommending here, you know, what, how do we know if we're making progress? And they said, we need to have a goal. And they set um, a goal of seeing 80% of women screened by 2021 and 100% screened by 2025. And, um, um, one of um, the foundation here um, that funded this work, uh, they were the ones that ended up funding that HEDIS measure development in part to see if, um, if we're actually meeting our goal by the year 2021, 2025. Um, so the emphasis I like to point out was also there's recognition that part of the challenge with maternal mental health is that no one's taking ownership. Um, similar to what we talked about through sort of federal agencies, like this issue doesn't fit cleanly in any one box. Um, and so um, the emphasis was that we need to declare one clinician to always be responsible for screening and that there should also be no wrong door. So other clinicians and even community-based organizations should also be screening um, uh, particularly if a woman presents with having challenges. Um, and so there should be no wrong door, but there also needs to be a home base um, and some, some clinician that's held accountable for detection and development of a treatment plan. And again, for folks that have questions about any of this along the way, please use the question feature um, to let us know if you have uh, questions. We'll pause here in, in a minute. Um, I wanted to also share the work product. So what came out of the commission besides the recommendations or the strategic plan were some new tools that didn't yet exist in the field of maternal mental health. One tool is provider core competencies. Um, so, so you can imagine um, certain trade 
trade associations have been wanting to do something around maternal mental health um, or want to help their providers understand it, but they really didn't know what to do, right? Um, and dappled, but um, the, this task force felt it was critical to issue core competencies. So what should various providers know and be doing? Um, psychiatrists are listed. Um, reproductive psychiatrists are spiked out, like what is the nuance and what additional core competencies must a reproductive psychiatrist have? What should a lactation consultant be doing? Um, what about community-based um, um, providers? What should they be doing? And um, what should OBGYNs versus pediatricians, et cetera, be doing? So core competencies, that's in the report. Um, and I'll show you the report, where to find the report on our website in just a moment. There's also a continuum of care, not super helpful to, for, from a practical standpoint, but just recognizes that we need to think about interconception care, we need to think about um, pregnancy, um, postpartum, and inpatient care as well, which um, or hospital-based care, which can be labor and delivery, ER, um, uh, high-risk pregnancies where a mother is inpatient, um, you know, NICU points of care, so that continuum of care, recognizing there's, there's uh, needs to be a holistic view. Um, we also, um, um, the task force wanted to see that, that there be some sort of recommendation, uniform recommendation on how often screening should happen. Um, research uh, is not consistent. There's sort of no consistent standard. The research sometimes can't be compared and various researchers use different cutoffs and uh, timeframes for screening. Um, and again, I already touched on cutoffs. So we turn to our partner a nonprofit postpartum support international and ask them if, if they and their clinical committee would want to develop a, um, a screening recommendation set on cutoff and timing recommendations. Um, it's, it's quite robust and recommends a lot of screening at various times, um, which is not surprising coming from an organization that's been advocating for change, postpartum support international, but it's still a helpful guideline for all clinicians, um, and if at the very least to know, you know, at what point should I, if I have to pick two times to screen out of the six times that are recommended, when would I maybe do it? Um, and you can find that in the task force paper and also on the Postpartum Support International website. There's also a menu of treatment options. This was adapted from the toolkit that uh, Massachusetts uses in McPat for Moms and their training program for OBGYN. It's a menu of tr treatment options uh, uh, treatment options that are um, um, evidence-based, um, recognizing that now more than ever, especially young women, um, may or may not feel comfortable at least starting with medication unless they're in a severe state, and that they should be involved in developing their treatment um, um, protocol and treatment plan if we want treatment to be successful. So a range of treatment options um, are included in that menu, again, in the, in the white paper report, also on our website. Um, in a separate page of resources for providers. There's also detailed recommendations for various stakeholder groups, including all of the trade associations um, um, and uh, various organizations. So feel free to take a look at that later. I'm gonna just spend one more minute uh, on um, the recommendations. I'm not gonna go into all of this. We already talked about number one. I'm not going into it in detail, um, but I already talked a little bit about number one um, that um, there isn't a home base or hasn't been a home base previously and now should be with um, obstetricians and that also referral pathways and capacity issues to treat and screen um, uh, are a problem. And then there's various sub, um, subsets of recommendations there on the page. Number two, need to integrate mental health and medical systems. We all have talked a lot about that. Um, there is a, a kind of a unique recommendation in the California Strategic Plan that points to the large barrier on that front being with how we reimburse providers, uh, mental health providers and medical providers separately through separate contracts through insurers. And then that, that's really the big elephant in the room until we have insurance integration, we aren't able to fully integrate mental health into medical systems. Um, uh, you know, for the most part, um, but, uh, you know, we know that's happening in some cases in large clinics where uh, pediatricians or mental health is already embedded and uh, there's large systems that work on billing. And so the, the, in those larger systems, it doesn't tend to be as much of a barrier as it does for kind of mom and pop shops. Um, well, uh, measurement for screening rates, we already talked about that HEDIS measure development a general recommendation and barrier that all women need more education and support 
um, we won't go into all the details uh, there, and then that there, there was a need for detailed recommendations for stakeholders, so we talked about that already as well. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now and just share there's quite a few resources for all of you um, that are interested in following the work more closely or, um, as we suspect, based on that last question and know um, from the audience that want to do more work on a state level in, um, in your state, uh, you can find the following resources on our um, website, um, various blog posts, which you saw a snippet of. Um, there's also a community action toolkit, which can be used as a starting point. Um, and a model for developing a state um, commission or a state uh, you know, Blue Ribbon Commission or task force. Um, also to that end, um, we have the state strategic plan that was issued in California um, that is now available in a template form so that states that do run a Blue Ribbon Commission or task force don't have to start from scratch. Um, they can edit, modify a template uh, we also think it's really helpful for um, task forces to kind of chunk out their task force meetings, et cetera. Um, we're also starting to do some informal state policy calls with you know, Michigan, I mentioned, we talked with them yesterday, um, but others, um, um, we supported Florida in the same way, uh, in Utah early on. So for, for those that are really interested in doing this work and are serious and already have a coalition, coalition partners, um, you know, we're interested in supporting your work if you need some help. Um, and then lastly, I'll just share if you're not already signed up for our e-newsletter, it's full of um, free webinars, uh, information, um, all of these new blog posts, you know, it's a way to stay up to date on uh, the national landscape. So let's pause and see if there is anyone else that has a question. Um, Someone asked, I see, Crystal, I do, I'll just take this one. I see that someone's asking about the HEDIS measure development. Um, I am actually going to do a blog post on that soon. Um, the, the measurement, as I recall, happens next year. So the measure is still being fine-tuned and rolled out. It's like a quite a comprehensive, really comprehensive process through the National Quality Committee and then NCQA, the National Quality for, Committee for Quality Assurance. Um, has to in incorporate into their national program. Um, as I recall, measurement starts next year, which would mean the results are available in 2021. So still kind of far off, um, but uh, you know, great that the process uh, was put in motion. Um, let's see if there, oh, someone just said they already joined their Maternal Mortality Review Committee. Um, that's great. Uh, and Crystal, if you can help, uh, if, for those that do webinars, um, ours is a little bit wonky with respect to pulling up questions, a little tricky. So, Crystal, if you can help me find the other questions, um, that's all I'm seeing so far. There might be others that have um, addressed or made some comments about uh, their work. Um, yeah, there's some yeah, that you've... Even... Go ahead. You've partially addressed some of this, but I'll just ask to see if you can fill in the gaps. Is question about if there's any work around pediatricians being trained to recognize problems with the child that suggests the mother may be struggling. Um, and then also, yeah. mm -hmm. and what work is being done around that if you screen in postpartum care? If it won't, since it doesn't necessarily show up immediately, how can one visit be enough? Again, I think you addressed a little bit of that, but maybe you want to fill in the gaps. Yeah. Um... Well, first I'll say there's a lot of great work happening in the early childhood movement. Um, we we presented at the Zero to Three conference last year, and uh, it was probably there was probably 350 people in the room. There's a lot of interest in that space, but I would say look at the the American Academy of Pediatrics um, gui guidelines. The um, boy, I already forgot the name. I said it earlier. Um, you know, email me, how about this? And I'll forward you some, some additional information, but there's a lot of great work that the American Academy of Pediatrics is doing on this front. I haven't been following to your, you know, very specific question about, uh, you know, there's effort around screening to recognize that it's tied to developmental problems. But I think you were asking, you know, what if there's a developmental problem, maybe should those moms be prioritized? And I think you're right. Um, and I don't know that the AAP has really addressed that because they're really trying to look at all moms being screened still in the pediatric setting, but feel free to email me and I can send you some additional information on that front. I know here in California, I know we've got a first five um, champion on the, the line and most states have an early 
childhood, um, um, you know, it's a state agency or an agency funded by state funds, um, that there's a lot of effort on that front. So it'll be a fun, um, you know, really interesting to kind of follow that work. If anyone has more to add, throw it in the comments section here, and we're happy to kind of collate, um, you know, any resources and send them back out to any of you who are interested. Um, my email address, I'll pull, pull it up here um, right now, is joy at 2020mom.org. Also, the website is here, 2020mom.org. Um, it's also where you can sign up for e-news. Feel free to reach out if you have more questions. Uh, Crystal, you touched on how could one visit be enough. We totally agree. One visit, one visit in the postpartum period is not enough, and one screen in the perinatal period is not enough. And again, it, it's really why um, the field is starting to recommend, um, and we strongly believe that if you're only going to screen once, right, which in California the law says you have to screen at least once, um, we're saying do it early in pregnancy. It's a way to educate moms, um, even if they're not suffering at that time, but might, you know, might later. It's a way to destigmatize mental health, recognize it as a medical condition, um, the medical condition that it is, right? It's part of our body, our brains, um, and uh, ensure that there's, there's a discussion, a safe conversation. You know, we hope that some providers have better skills and bedside manner than others, but at least moms will have heard something about this and not be um, as left in the dark as so many moms have been in the past. So we're saying at least do it during pregnancy um, and get women into treatment right away to prevent preterm birth, right? And they deserve treatment anyway as humans during pregnancy, um, but also um, gives moms a chance to, to learn about it and then know that they can come back to their OBGYN later. And, and say, I'm, I'm starting to feel really bad. And I remember you screening before. Any other questions? And I think we're just a few minutes over. We'll send out the recording for those of you that have to drop, um, but we'll just continue to answer question. questions. Sure. Joy, um, regarding the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, there's a question regarding specific state reporting. The, the question is that in the state of Arizona, Maternal mental health records are not included in the review because they're not considered part of the medical records. Do you know if other states, perhaps if California includes maternal mental health records in their maternal mortality review committees? Yes, um, such an important question. We actually are working with the CDC on suicide tracking and incorporation of suicide through the maternal mortality review committee process in a more uniform way. Um, be looking out for a blog, a blog post soon. Um, next month is Suicide Awareness Month, and we will be publishing an update. There's already a couple of updates on our blog now around suicide tracking and CDC efforts, but it should be a standard. California um, has um, you know, one of the strongest maternal mortality review um, um, committees in the, in the country, um, and ha is looking at suicide. Um, three years ago, started to look at suicide, and there's a pending report that will come out of California's Maternal Mortality Review Committee um, on suicide, just on suicide, the causes, um, you know, during the perinatal period. So something's forthcoming on that on that front. We also, um, the University of San Francisco uh, and one other university in California partnered together and did a study. And it wasn't even California data, if I'm remembering correctly, on maternal suicide. Um, and really what we're starting to see in here is it, in some cases, it's the leading cause. We're not saying that out loud. You know, I can say it on this webinar because it just depends on what data set you're looking at. And, um, you know, we really want to work collectively together on maternal mortality, but make sure suicide is not left out of those conversations. Um, I do know there's some great work happening. And in fact, one of our team members is going to be sitting on the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, as I recall, um, in Arizona. Um, so I think there's there's some of that um, changing, as I, I've heard in Arizona, but I'd love to hear back from the person that asked that question, if there's, if there's more we can help with, you think. All right. Well, on that note, we're going to go ahead and wrap up um, today's call. We're so glad that you joined us. And for those of you that are listening retrospectively, feel free to outreach us at any time um, if we can help you in your work to close gaps in maternal mental health care. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day.